Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. We're delighted that you can join us today for our Courageous Conversations Catalyzing Change events and the Foundations and Funders Tech Equity team. Uh, we're thrilled that Oscar Sweet and Lopez will be leading um, this discussion today. And I'd like to start by just sharing a little bit about Global Minded, and then I'll be introducing Oscar. So Global Minded is about creating a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, uh, underrepresented, any way you can define diversity is how we define diversity into the education, economic mobility, and employment pipeline. So we lead these sessions now that we're virtual this year, and hopefully uh, after this year, we will not be virtual anymore. We'll be seeing you all in person, but it's been a real pleasure to work with you all virtually. And I know that you have very generously shared these sessions with a lot of your networks. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Oscar Sweeten Lopez, who is the president and founder of GradSnap. He is, uh, runs the College Success Tools Program at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. And he is the past president of the board of directors for the National Scholarship Providers Association. He is mission-driven uh, college graduate. Uh, uh, okay, you guys are gonna have to forgive me because now I gotta put on my, my glasses here. These are my 58 year old eyes. I just can't do what I used to do. Um, he's college graduation motivated, technology obsessed. He's also first gen to college, which we love since so many of the students we serve are also first gen. And for over a decade, Oscar served as portfolio director for the successful Dell Scholars Program. He works directly advising students in developing high engagement programs that are models that can scale. And that provided him the experience and insights to build technology that addresses the needs of college success advisors who are working with first gen and underrepresented students. So welcome Oscar and panelists and we're really delighted you all are here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great and thank you Carol for the uh, invitation and again the opportunity to be, to be here with you the global minded community and with such a great panel of uh, professionals that are all um, so dedicated into this work. Um, as Carol mentioned, I'm the uh, president and founder of GradSnap, and I just wanted to, to give a little bit of background on that in terms of how that relates to today's discussion as well. Um, so GradSnap is an initiative of the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, where, as Carol mentioned, I have been uh, leading our Dell Scholars Program, um, and, uh, and we eventually created GradSnap as a response to uh, the needs that we saw in the college completion space for organizations, whether it's scholarship programs, school districts supporting their high school alumni through college completion, or uh, the you know, <clears throat> great amount of different nonprofits that are out there doing college access and success. Um, we saw an opportunity to take the internal technology that we had built for our own Dell Scholars Program and think about you know, how do we invest and, uh, and promote this type of tool you know, into the space in a slightly different way than maybe a traditional uh, grant to help an organization develop their own tools. Um, and so I really wanted to share a little bit of that background just to say that, you know, uh, again, in our own work at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, we're always looking for, you know, innovative ways that we can execute our mission. Uh, ultimately, you know, on the higher ed side, our goal is to see more underserved students, you know, really graduate college, uh, not as the end goal, but really as the means to being able to, you know, access greater career and life opportunities for themselves and their families. Um, and so it's that kind of thinking and always being you know, willing to uh, you know, revisit how we're doing our work that is important to us uh, and, uh, and helps us you know, stay, I think, you know, ahead of the curve or trying to be as, as far ahead as we can in terms of really being responsive to the needs of, of the communities that we're focused on supporting and the mission that we're trying to drive for. Um, and so, you know, with that, given uh, kind of where we are today in terms of uh, the events of 2020, uh, even how 2021 has started off for us um, and, and uh, being based in Texas, uh, you know, having dealt last week with the uh, blizzard conditions that we are definitely not uh, used to and as we saw, not prepared for uh, in the state. Um, I think all of those examples, you know, just kind of the current events of the time 
you know, really do serve as an inflection point uh, for us, you know, as a country, uh, you know, and for us uh, involved in philanthropy or those of us that work uh, and connect with philanthropy um, to really take a deep look at, you know, where do we go from here? Um, do we just think about our work uh, in terms of the same status quo and kind of keep doing the same thing? Or do we, you know, really take a step back and look at, you know, um, uh, you know, opportunities to really be bold in our thinking and in our approach uh, to really try to move the needle, you know, uh, on equity and, and the role that philanthropy plays, uh, you know, in being able to advance that uh, and creating that just and equitable future, you know, for all of our communities. Um, so with that, I want to, you know, just pause there and, uh, and really um, take time to have our, our uh, esteemed panel be able to introduce themselves uh, their current roles, and then, you know, even anything that they might want to share personally about their own journey. Um, and so we'll do intros, and then we'll dive right into the discussion. Um, and so let me just kind of kick it off. Uh, we'll go with Richard, Frank, Botile, Chantel, and then Jamie. So um, Richard, if you'd like to kick us off. Oh, great. Richard Brown, uh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate today in this conversation. I'm with American Express. I'm the VP for philanthropy there. Frank. Great. Frank Fernandez, uh, President and CEO of the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta. I've uh, been uh, here for about six months. Um, the only thing I would just add in terms of this conversation, today's conversation around equity, equity is something that has been uh, my professional North Star for the last 20 years uh, and something that you know, clearly is uh, top of mind for more and more people. And I think one of the things that I hope gets teased out today and something that we're actively engaged in is really being clear about what we mean by equity, because equity has many dimension, dimensions, many facets. Racial equity clearly is front and center right now, but also gender equity, geographic equity, educational equity. And so all these facets are, are interconnected. So, but how do we talk about them? How do we develop a common understanding? So that's uh, what I'm interested in. So happy to be here. Great to see everyone. Clotilde uh, Presbody D. Decker, delighted to be here. President and CEO of the Community Foundation for Greater Buffalo, been with the foundation for about 15 years. And advancing racial equity uh, is our North Star um, as a philanthropic entity. And uh, we focus on systems change uh, with that North Star. Hi, Chantel George, uh, founder and CEO of CG Consulting based here in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm excited to be with all of you today. Uh, a little bit about my background. I've been about 10 years in the post-secondary college access and success space um, and so have maneuvered around higher education, K through 12 charter systems, nonprofits, and now consulting. And so now have the opportunity to work with all of those facets to really figure out um, ways to continue to encourage our students um, to pursue post-secondary pathways and also help organizational leaders and foundations really understand what it means um, in regards to college and career readiness. So I'm also excited to engage in this conversation. Great. And I'm uh, Jamie Van Leeuwen. I'm the CEO and founder of the Global Livingston Institute. We're a best practices community development organization that's based out of Uganda and Rwanda. Uh, and um, uh, I spent about 15 years working and managing all of the uh, community partnerships and homelessness and housing work for um, Mayor and then Governor Hickenlooper uh, and now uh, Senator Hickenlooper. And, uh, um, I'm delighted to be here and, and part of this conversation today. I, uh, my other hat that I wear is I, I direct youth and community engagement uh, for a social justice organization called the Emerson Collective. Wonderful. Well, it is a pleasure uh, to have all of you here with us today. Um, we really appreciate you making the time to join us in this discussion. Um, so before we jump into the questions, you know, again, uh, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, again, the role of philanthropy, you know, our direct role in terms of, you know, my professional responsibilities um, and, uh, and just some things that kind of came to mind, you know, again, around, you know, how do we um, not just continue the status quo? Obviously, you know, the issues that we're dealing with today that in many ways have been highlighted, you know, um, uh, you know uh, with a much greater focus over the last year, those issues have, have always been there, you know, they've, they've existed. And so it's not like we're dealing with something new, but maybe we have an opportunity to think about it 
in a slightly different way. And so, um, you know, one quote I just wanted to share briefly, it's from uh, Edgar Villanueva uh, in terms of, uh, from his book, Decolonizing Wealth, uh, Indigenous Wisdom to Heal Divides and Restore Balance. Um, he does a really good job of, I think, again, you know, really having, uh, asking some tough questions in terms of philanthropy and us really thinking about, um, you know, how that works. And so I wanted to share uh, just this one quote. Um, the lesson is that thriving is not actually about the leader. It's about the whole flock. Everyone has the potential to lead and leadership is about listening and being attuned to everyone else. It's about flexibility. It's about humility. It's about trust. It's about having fun along the way. And it's uh, more about holding space for others brilliance and being, than being the sole answer or the sole source of answers. It's more about flexibility, shape shifting to meet the oncoming challenges than holding fast to the five-year strategic plan. Um, so I thought that was just a, a really, you know, kind of a meaningful way to really encapsulate uh, the the fact that, you know, for many of us in philanthropy, you know, we've got our, uh, our, our 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 ways that we operate. You know, this is how we've done the work over the years, um, and uh, you know, and and is that working, you know, for us? And so. Um, Again, knowing that those issues and what you know serves as our north star for many of us, you know, have been around and, and continue to be issues that we need to confront. Um, you know, how do we use this uh, kind of time in our in our country and in our lives right now to really try to take a different step or, or think about the work maybe in a different way? Um, so the first question that I have for the group uh, is really a bit more on the personal side, and it kind of touches a little bit to what Frank uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, in terms of how we define equity, um, but I really wanted to start with, um, you know, just how, you know, what does equity mean to you? Uh, so this is this is for the whole panel. What does equity mean to you, and how does that personally influence your professional approach? Because I think if we start with that, then we can really dive more into, you know, the work that you guys are all leading. Um, but I'd love to hear uh, again from, uh, you know, from a personal perspective, you know, how you define equity or think about that uh, on a personal level. Um, so let me just see if anybody wants to jump in. If not, I'll, I'll definitely uh, go ahead and call on somebody. Anybody want to go first? Well, we've been advancing racial equity in, in uh, particular for 15 years, and we define equity versus equality as fair opportunity and removing systemic barriers to fair opportunity and being selective um, and, and understanding that when you have a community that, that um, represents people who are differently situated, you need differentiated strategies to get to equality. So equity is about fair opportunity so that we can have equal outcomes. Maybe I'll just go ahead and call on folks. Um, I, can, I, can, go to I, can, next. I can add to that. Um, Richard, you yeah. know, I think there is a, you know, there is, as mentioned, a difference between equity and equal. Um, you know, it, we could all be very equal there, but there still can be uh, historical biases that have, will prevent us from really having the same level of access. And so I think when we talk about equity, we have to take it a step further and really consider what a person's background is and what their history has been and what type of, uh, what type of historical pervasive bias may have entered into their lives that really would prevent them from having the same access and equal treatment. And so equity is so, for me, takes a step further and it's, it's an important distinction as well. I think they, folks said it well, the only thing I would add, like how I have defined it for myself is, is at its core, this is personally and professionally, it's about what can we do to help ensure that everyone has a fair shot at a decent life and then you start layering in all the different things that either give folks advantage or disadvantage, right? So in, in, in where I'm from here or where I'm at right now, the race is front and central to everything, right? And that probably is true for a lot of folks in the South and maybe equally true in other places, but I know that to be true here, but it is not the only thing that confers either advantage or disadvantage, right? And so part of it for me is to think through really the, the, the wide array of different systems uh, that, that do that, right? Whether it's, it's think, thinking about gender, it's thinking about geography, uh, it's all these things that contribute to it. And what can we do to help individuals and groups be able to remove those systemic barriers uh, as, as well as just lift them up so that they have that fair shot at a decent life, so. 
Yeah, I'll go ahead and add to that as well. Um, two words come into mind when I think about equity and that is uh, perspective and opportunity. And as being a, a black woman, a dark skinned black woman here in Louisiana comes with its own challenges. And for me, stepping out onto entrepreneurship, um, it, it, it is a roller coaster. And, and I always say one of the biggest um, things that I'm really proud of about my team is that they all consist of people of color. And I'm strategic and intentional about that, specifically around the consulting space where um, I had worked in the field for 10 years and had worked with several consulting firms and, and none of them looked like me. Um, but yet we are strategizing around students of color. We are strategizing around low income communities. And, and I am those students. I am a part of those communities. And so in order really to strive for equity, we have to be very conscious um, about um, the funding, the board members, the, the individuals that we're working with. Do they really reflect the students and the communities that you serve? And if not, how do we continue? How do we push to really get um, to that point? And so from a personal standpoint, um, I, I am constantly striving to get there and also hiring and, and bringing on people along a part of the journey, because that is something really important is to also, how do you bring other talented expertise into the rooms that they're normally not able to be in? Um, so again, uh, opportunity and perspective has really been personal and professional for me when I think about um, the road where, the journey we're on um, to equity. Um, that was awesome, Chantel. And, and Oscar and, and Kelly, I think that just the responses from everybody answered in front of me uh, um, uh, indicates I, I think equity is is unbelievably complicated and multi-layered um, you know as we've had to really turn the, the the mirror inward over this past year and look at it again a lot of us who thought we were addressing equity are having to say well where are we uh, and and where what areas are we missing uh, and I look at the the Global Livingston Institute uh, and and we we juxtapose our work between the United States and, and Africa. And when we're working in communities in Uganda and Rwanda, there's obviously equity issues that you address. Uh, but then when you start taking interns uh, and engaging young people in international development, um, there's equity in terms of who gets to participate in international development and global opportunities in the United States and those who don't. Uh, and so we have to start addressing those issues and, and really looking at how does all of that interplay, especially when you're, you're dealing with, with equity that's at, that a number of different layers in our communities for those of us who are doing community development work or philanthropy are, uh, are, are recognizing and, and, and at least uh, appreciating how unbelievably um, uh, uh, thoughtful we have to be across the board. It's not just, a, it, there's not one, uh, there's not just one way it manifests itself, but it's, it's multifaceted and, and there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to really address some of those issues. And actually, Jamie, let me kind of continue with you on, on uh, again, on the, the work that you're currently doing and, and kind of being in two different geographies. Are there any lessons learned, I guess, that can go both ways? Or, or how does that play out in terms of, you know, your kind of U.S. team and your, you know, uh, East African-based team? I'd love to learn more about, you know, just, uh, again, what is the perception kind of on the African side of what, uh, you know, what that looks like? Uh, you know, from their perspective or, or vice versa. But I, I think it's just really interesting to see, you know, um, to being able to work kind of in two different geographies and, and are there any differences in terms of how you think about it uh, or how it's perceived and, and then how you go about trying to execute that, that reality? Sure. Well, I'm excited to be able to give this answer now because I've been telling my team, of, we've been talking about this on our team so they don't have to listen to me talk about this uh, today. You, you all uh, get to, but you know, it's so interesting because I, you know, when you all host the same conversation two years from now, there's two years of stuff that we're going to look back on that we didn't even realize today that we, we needed to learn that, that we're just starting to absorb from, from the COVID uh, um, uh, experience that we've all gone through. And, and um, I, you know, I think that the back and forth is it, it, it's raised some really fascinating issues for our team. So we have a team that works, a small team in the United States, and then most of our team is Ugandan based. Uh, and as we started going, into the, the, um, uh, the COVID um, uh, experience, um, what we learned is that our, our African team was way more adaptable than our, our US team. They're the ones who are coming to us saying, well, we've been, we, we can do this and we can figure this piece out and here's an idea, what if we, what if we did this? Uh, and I, I think what we're, it's, it's leveled the playing field in terms of, not leveled, I hate saying that because it didn't bring it down, it brought it up. 
our teams had to raise, uh, 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 rise to the occasion for our, our colleagues who are in Uganda who are saying, hey, we're actually on the ground here. We can tell you where we need the most support and kind of how to lead and, and what that looks like. And so, um, so it changed people's roles and responsibilities in ways that we didn't anticipate. I also think that, you know, when I look at it, um, uh, we, we have to, on an international basis, uh, start figuring out how to learn from one another. One of the, the things that the Global Living Sin Institute really pushes on is that, that piece of the, the purpose of uh, NGO and, and, and nonprofit work is not to go to Africa and fix things. Uh, it's to, how do you learn from each other? How do you, we're not there to build schools, we're there to build partnerships. Uh, and, and it's interesting that Africa right now has, has actually done a, a remarkably decent job of managing COVID. Uh, and, and we tend to go in a, go after Africa when there's Ebola or there's something going wrong in Africa. But when do we go to Africa and say, hey, there's probably some things that we could learn from you in terms of how you've managed uh, this situation that we could actually use in our own communities. And that's equity. Uh, it's not always being the teacher, but it's if you really wanna create equity, especially when you're working globally, are we willing to learn uh, and, and, and engage and adapt some of the ideas and principles that other communities have learned that could really inform our own work. And so I think that's been probably the, the, the most interesting piece is, is looking at how some of the communities have managed uh, this situation and, and what we can bring back to our own communities in the US um, as part of that experience. Yeah, super interesting. And again, I love the, the, the fact that you shared again, you know, there's really a lot that you know, we should be learning uh, you know, this is bi-directional uh, and it's not about, you know, kind of one side knowing or having all the answers and, and then, you know, bestowing that on, on the others. And so being able to be open and, and humble about that reality, I think, is super important, uh, especially in terms of, you know, how traditionally, I think, in philanthropy, you know, we've been kind of in that role of, of, of you know, kind of helping to guide others when, you know, when there's so much opportunity to really listen and learn, you know, from the folks that we are, are here to serve. Um, uh, and, and Richard, let me come to you next, because I think along those lines, you know, one thing that we've seen uh, in, is, you know, at least here in the United States, it's kind of a barometer of, you know, culturally where things are at. We've seen, you know, that a lot of corporations, you know, have stepped up in particular over the last, uh, you know, year related to, um, you know, some of the, the, the injustices that, that we see happening here. But, you know, when, you, when kind of the corporate community steps up, and takes a position, I think that really, you know, helps get the attention of, you know, of the, of, of the society or the country as a whole, that this is important, it's impacting business or business has, uh, you know, a, a perspective on this. And so, you know, within your role at American Express, it just would be interesting if there's, you know, things you can share of, you know, how, you know, maybe that work has changed, uh, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, responding to some of the events here, or, or, you know, or maybe where that's helped you guys double down on, on other initiatives that you already had in place. But I'd love to hear more about, you know, why uh, or kind of how from that kind of a more of a corporate philanthropic perspective, um, you know, you see that work evolving or changing, you know, given our, our current circumstances. Well, I can tell you, I've, um, I've been in, in corporate philanthropy for over 30 years. And uh, as you can imagine, the last year was like no other that I've been in uh, in those 30 years uh, due to a, you know, a, a pandemic that essentially we watched just kind of crawl across the earth uh, and infect and unfortunately kill so many people in many cases unnecessarily. And so the company I think really did step up uh, in, a, in a number of different ways, both to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also to the, the racial the racial reckoning pandemic that also um, came to the U.S. and actually took 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 root in other places, and so the company did come out with, like many companies, came out with some very specific uh, statements about what was going on. But really, to me, and what I'm really delighted about, and and, and actually quite happy about, is that the company actually decided to take a, a stand. And by putting its 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 money where its mouth is, and so the company uh, committed last year to provide fifty million dollars in grants by the end of twenty twenty four to support nonprofit organizations around the world that are led by people of color or underrepresented organizations, 
Uh, and so that to me was a pretty significant, we're not a huge bank, a uh, huge company where that's about 25% of our annual budget or a third of our philanthropic budget. So that's monies that are for our programming versus our employee driven efforts. So to us, that's a pretty significant uh, commitment. Uh, and under this, this commitment, we also founded the, the coalition to back black businesses with the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation, which is a multi-year commitment to support black owned businesses. We put in a $10 million over a, a four year period to support that particular initiative and actually have other companies who have joined us in that effort. And so we're pretty proud of that effort and what we've done with the first round of 600 grants that were made in, in 2020. Uh, we're also as a, as a company are doubling down on our, our diverse and money owned suppliers. We've also are providing capital to financial education to 250,000 black owned small businesses and medium sized businesses. And just yesterday, uh, you may have heard that we are, we announced the backing historical small restaurant program with the National Trust for Historic Preservation and are looking to support restaurants who would have really been hit dramatically by the pandemic uh, and providing, uh, we'll be providing 25 organizations around the country with money to support their efforts and, and keep them going so that they can thrive and that they can survive really the pandemic. So that's just a sampling of some of the things that the company has done. But I, I want to underscore the fact that um, it really was a, in my view, a stake in the ground that the company decided that they're going to come out with some really, you know, they're going to tell the employees, they're going to tell the, you know, the rest of the community that we we're obviously um, uh, support, we want to support the community and support the various communities of color. But I think by actually putting money and saying, well, we're going to actually commit money uh, in this case, $50 million uh, to this to these these types of organizations, really for me was a, um, it was pretty dramatic uh, and also uh, something that I'm gonna be actually pretty excited about implementing over the next four years. It's amazing, that's wonderful to hear. And again, it, it sounds like again, the, you know, because you were really able to, uh, again, identify some initiatives and execute on those fairly quickly, uh, you know, in response to a lot of what's been happening. Um, and so that, you know, again, is kind of more internally in terms of an organization responding to that. Um, uh, Franklin Cotillo, I want to kind of direct this next question to you guys, because the role that you guys have at the Community Foundation is, you know, slightly different uh, in terms of being able to partner with a lot of different uh, donors and funders that are, you know, approaching you about, um, you know, their, their uh, desires and what they're wanting to do in terms of, you know, their contribution. So, I'd love to hear again, how are you guys kind of, you know, balancing um, the, you know, the, the requests or, or, you know, what folks are wanting to do in terms of, you know, uh, creating funds or partnering with you, uh, even existing partnerships that you may have. Uh, how do you balance that in terms of those, you know, uh, funder directed kind of um, uh, goals uh, and, and, and uh, you know, outcomes that they're wanting to seek with, with maybe what you think is important or organization where you've identified, um, you know, areas that you think, uh, you know, you'd want to drive more investments in. And so uh, I think, again, kind of, you know, not just controlling the, the funds directly yourselves, but having to have that relationship and partnership. Uh, I'd love to hear kind of how that has either evolved or changed, um, you know, with existing partnerships that you have, or as you're approaching, um, you know, uh, new partnerships uh, to, to work with you through your community foundation work. Um, so I'll open it up if anybody wants to step in first between Frank. Well, sure. I, community foundations are unique because we are worldwide um, and it's um, 1800 uh, philanthropic town squares, right? So community foundations are a nexus for corporate philanthropy, Richard, and congratulations on the amazing work that um, American Express has been doing. Individual donors and um, private philanthropy and family philanthropy and government. So we are a philanthropic town, town square at the local level and we have many tools at our disposal, but most powerful is the power of relationships because that is what drives systemic long-term sustainable change and ownership, uh, which includes residents, the individuals who, who are, have the lived experience, who have the, the solutions and the answers they need for fair and equitable opportunity. So 
Often when we say foundations, we think of, title of this uh, session, foundations and funding. And funding is a very important tool, right? And I use the, uh, unfortunately, fossil fuel analogy. I need to come up with one that's a little greener. But you need to build a really good engine, and then you put gas in the tank to make the engine go. And funding is the gas in the tank for individual organizations and for systemic change. And by definition, systemic change takes lots of partners. If we're serious about advancing equity in the role philanthropy can play, um, then we need to set the stage and we need to use our power to convene cross-sector coalitions that involve and include meaningfully and upfront the residents with lived experience to get to big solutions because the challenges of equity are far and away beyond the reach of any one organization, any one foundation, any one government entity. So the work of the 21st century, if we're serious about leading toward more equitable communities, are cross-sector coalitions that get to solutions. So I'll give you a very brief example of what that looks like in Buffalo. The Say Yes Buffalo Partnership Education is so much uh, a part of uh, Global Minded, right? So um, we had had decades of declining high school graduation rent. And we, eight years ago, announced the Say Yes Buffalo Partnership. And this is about focusing on removing academic, financial, social, emotional, and health barriers to academic achievement for the students in the Buffalo Public Schools. Two quick stats. 80% students of color, 82% free and reduced lunch, 35,000 students. In the first seven years, we have increased the high school graduation rate by 27 percentage points. That, that's huge, right? 27 percentage point, taking it from 49% high school graduation to 76% high school graduation. And then our college going rate is now up 23%. So it's uh, the goal is post-secondary completion, broadly defined certificate, associate, or bachelor. So that is systems change, right? No one nonprofit, no one after school program, no one community organizing organization can do that on its own. No one school district, no one foundation. But when we all got around the table together with the parents, the students, higher ed, and the private sector funding a universal scholarship, which acts as the North Star for this program while we're providing all these comprehensive supports. Now we got game and now we took those meta trends that were heading in the wrong direction and reversed them. So that's an example of what community philanthropy is there to do that no other philanthropy is, is positioned as well to do at the local level. I think Cotillo uh, said it perfectly. It is, it's about relationships. It's about collaboration. And, and I think that is the role of, of community foundations for us. I think we are called to bring together our, our donors, other foundations, our, our private sector partners, as well as our public sector partners. I want to talk about that uh, to try to help solve the most pressing challenges. Right? And we saw that very clearly for us in, in the last year when you had these multiple crises all at once in terms of responding to the pandemic and all the other things that happened in 2020. And, and, and the, the, I try to find silver linings in this crisis, right? Because we're, we're gonna hit our one year anniversary pretty soon, which is kind of crazy uh, being in this crazy world we're in. Um, and to me, one of those is that it's kind of made people very much more open than they were before to collaboration, especially philanthropy. I can't speak for the philanthropic community in Buffalo, but here in the South, we tend not to work as collaboratively as I think we should or need to. And I think this pandemic has forced us to really re-examine that. And we've seen with our partners, a lot of folks really stepping up and wanting to act differently, and which has been great. Uh, and we saw that with our, you know, our media examples on the COVID fund, which we tried to bring up more and more a racial equity lens too. We were able to quickly raise about $30 million to really address all of the, um, the response portions of what we needed to address. And, and now we're pivoting to the recovery side of it in terms of how do we not move to back to normal, but how do we get to a better normal and bringing that, that equitable and that inclusive lens to that work. Um, and part of the, to me, what I think we're called to do, which I think is really important is 
historically, at least here, folks have been uh, hesitant or reticent to work with the public sector, partially because um, it, things can get politicized very quickly. And then the, the second thing they don't want to say, which is connected to that, is it gets racialized. And it, you know, philanthropy by and large is white. And a lot, at least in Atlanta, a lot of the, the, the public sector leaders and, and workforce is black. And it creates all kinds of funky dynamics that people don't want to talk about. But we don't have the luxury of not engaging, especially now in this moment, from my perspective, where you have effectively with the CARES Act, the act that just got passed in December and the perspective, $2 trillion that's going to get passed in the next few weeks. You have all these federal dollars coming into our communities to address the issues that we care about. Um, and that money will not be as effective if philanthropy doesn't step up to fill gaps and to do the things that public money can't do. And that only will happen if you're willing to get your, you know, kind of get in the mud of it. And so to me, that too, it is one of the things that is a good server lining is people are more willing to do that and, and do that together, right? And, and so to me, that, that those are some of the things that we're focused on right now. Absolutely, Frank. And, and we've been blessed with uh, very strong relationships with our public sector. Uh, and this, this uh, solution, this collaborative solution that has led to these outcomes I talked about for Say Yes, uh, includes $14 million of annual public funding that has been repurposed to provide those comprehensive supports in the schoolhouse buildings. So couldn't do it without the public sector and the private sector and the nonprofit sector. So it is a cross sector. Um, that's, that is the work of the 21st century. The 20th century was the silo development of the, of the nonprofit sector. 21st century is about cross sector coalitions working collaboratively. That's a, it's a great transition, uh, Clotilde, I think too, in terms of the role of Chantel that you play, you've uh, you know, obviously been at a lot of the you know, various different nonprofits that are often the recipients of, of philanthropic dollars. You've had that experience working directly there. Uh, you've partnered with philanthropy in other ways. And, and now in your consulting work, you know, kind of really get to span that space. And so I'd, I'd love to hear again from your perspective, like, you know, what guidance or, or, you know, what do you think needs to change from the way that we've been doing business historically to what we need to do differently to really, you know, drive equity in, in the way that we've kind of defined it in, in today's conversation? Yeah, Oscar, thank you for that question. And uh, I'm trying to be brief, but that, that is a lot to answer. Um, and, and, and Frank, you brought up a good point about how do we fill in the gaps and, and how does philanthropy and funding fill in the gaps? And, and, and that is what's needed. I remember when the pandemic first hit and many of us who are working closely with school districts, nonprofits, right? Everybody, I would say, kind of went insane of like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Are our funders still going to fund? Um, how do we change our model to virtual? I mean, we were on we all shifted gears. I don't think any of us have had a chance to really breathe in a year because we've been moving and, and changing and shifting and trying to stay above water um, and, and really trying to figure out how do we continue to stay relevant as nonprofits, but also serve the students um, in our communities. And so one part about for me as being directly working with students um, and still trying to get on the ground, it's so important to really have the time, even though we're virtually, to really step foot in classrooms, to really talk to teachers and principals and really understand what's going on, on the ground to articulate to funders what exactly the need is, right? Like students need direct funding in their pockets. So a lot of times I always say, try to fund emergency funds if you can. Try to think about ways to think outside the box as opposed to funding, which you normally fund, which are like big scale initiatives and technology and workforce development and all of those things are amazing, but students need money and they need it now, right? They need to be able to pay for their gaps. They need to be able to have food and housing insecurity and mental health awareness and therapy and all of the things that are really important that if you are not on the ground, you do not understand what that is or, or it doesn't come um, to that to that perspective. So I would say perspectives are important. And as you're bringing up the bringing in everybody at the table, which is so important, you have to really think about the students and the individuals and the youth that are really um, the end users for all of this. And so I often try to bring their voices um, in those spaces to make sure that we are um, trying to get to that, get the funding to them um, as soon as possible. And as far as organizations, I live in the world and the bubble of college and career readiness, which is, uh, I would say it was a debate prior to the, uh, the pandemic. And it really still is a debate about 
are we really preparing students to complete a bachelor's degree and whatnot? Or are we really bringing students into this workforce and career readiness space, um, which there are funders who want to fund that, who want to fund workforce development and employer pipelines, um, which is exciting. But I also want us to think about equity. And so I've been in a lot of those conversations and kind of ringing the bell of, let's think about what does that mean? Because if I'm talking to a board that are predominantly white conservative, conservative men, and I'm saying, you want to do this welding program, or you want to fund this credential, are you telling your children to do those programs, right? Or are you saying you should apply to the UTs and the LSU of the world? Um, so I, I want us to be very conscious of those conversations. And as we are bringing all these amazing people to the table who have the funding, let us make sure that we are staying relevant and that we are not further marginalizing some of the students in the, from those communities, but rather closing those gaps. Um, and to the point around increasing high school graduation rates and college attainment rates, um, which is what we're trying to do. Um, and we've been able to push the needle, but the needle is only being pushed so far. We, there's so much work to do. And there's also ways that we really need to think about um, the data, right? Are we really looking at the data and the stories behind the data? What do those high school graduation pathways exist of? What do those curriculum programs look like? In different states, there's multiple different um, high school graduation requirements, right? If you're requiring a certain career cluster or you're requiring students to complete this path over that path to increase your graduation rate, what are we really saying about the communities in those states? And so I'm really a voice of reason and I keep it real in those conversations to really say, hey, let's think that if you have an idea that you wanna fund, let's think about it. And so it's been a really a great opportunity for me to bring a perspective to many foundations and even nonprofit leaders who are kind of taking a step back and saying, how do we really take a step back and pause and reevaluate and then try to, to, um, to push the needle and also trying to figure out how do we focus and be great at one thing, right? I have this book, Good to Great, that I'm constantly rereading of like, there's a lot of nonprofits who are really circling around each other of like, everyone is trying to save the world, which is awesome, but who is really doing what well? And how do we partner in that way to make sure that we're doing the best for students as opposed to everybody doing everything? Because what happens is foundations are funding the same 10, 15 organizations, but what about that small community foundation in rural Mississippi or Alabama that doesn't have the clout but needs the money to really make their organization thrive? How do they get into those rooms? Um, so those are some conversations that I've been hearing and being a part of um, on the ground. And I'm based here in Louisiana, but because of virtual, my clients are everywhere. And so really have been able to hear different perspectives and how the pandemic has shifted the way we thought um, about foundations and funding. Oscar, can I, uh, Chantel and, and my colleagues, uh, touched on something, I think also when we get in the equity thing, I think um, the, the whole piece on relationships um, and as we're thinking about that multi-layer uh, around equity, the other thing that Chantel prompted me to kind of think about is, is also the, the it, it, when we're thinking about equity, how are we thinking about the, the relationship between the funder uh, and the people that we're funding? Uh, and it's not just, listen, I think Chantel nailed it in terms of we've got to listen to what the needs are, but then how do you build a trusting enough relationship uh, between the funder? I, I've been on both sides of it. When I was working on homelessness, I was the funder. Um, how, do we, how do we get receptive to when we're funding something that's not working, having our grantees tell us that it's not working that way without having to worry about losing their funding? but yeah. wanting to work and build. So how do you create a more equitable relationship between the two partners so that there's an openness to be able to say, hey, Chantel, what you funded, we thought it was gonna work this way, but it's not. But what if we did it this way? And are you open to that? And, and can we create a, a enough trust in those relationships and enough equity in them that people feel comfortable telling somebody because the funder tends to have the, the, right. the power dynamic how do we lower that power dynamic to say, if it's not working, you've got to tell me, I won't take your money away. Let's yeah. figure out how to make it work. Uh, That's and, a great and point. have those dialogues, so. That's a great point, Jamie. And, and to answer your question, it, it starts with the conversation of making sure you're building the relationship. And to your point, a lot of nonprofits are like, 
we've gotten all this money, we have to deliver on these goals. And when the pandemic hit, many, many of, of us, because I put myself in the category, many of us had to rethink about our metrics, our benchmarks, and the things we said we were going to do, the quotas we said we were going to meet. We're, we're not going to meet them because we are literally in the in a global pandemic. And then I can go on my sidebar about how some of those uh, uh, quotas are, are unrealistic, but that's another panel. Nevertheless, um, I would say that it is, it is a conversation of building the trust and being very real in the beginning and saying, hey, like, this is what we want to do. Let's talk together. Let's meet your needs, our needs. And I would also encourage funders to not only speak to a CEO when you're thinking about funding something, but talk to those folks on the ground, talk to those success coaches, talk to those operation managers, talk to the individuals that are outside of the C-suite who can really tell you what's going on in whatever area um, of the nonprofit, because a lot of times they are not in those conversations, um, but they are being told to execute on a pilot or something that has just been funded. So that that is a, a, a something to, to think about, but I would say it all it's all in trust, it's all in also from a funding perspective, staying in those spaces, you know, it's okay if you don't hit 20,000 students, right? It's okay if, if it takes you two or three years to create whatever pilot we're funding. It's not the end of the world. You're not going to lose funding. Um, so I think it really is the, the back and forth communication and being very honest about what, it, what is possible and what is not possible um, in those spaces. Uh, can you look. speak a little bit, Jamie, to the, to the limitations of programmatic support um, versus, you know, the, the reality when if you're if philanthropy is really serious about changing lives, then we all know what that looks like. And it's not a logic model or a theory of change, right? Because life happens. So if you if you have trusting relationships with grantees, then give them the funding you can give them and move out of the way and then learn with them, you know, as they actually um, execute their different strategies rather than all of these um, artificial, you know, we, anybody who's raised children knows that you don't just plan it out, right? You, you fasten your seatbelt and you get on the roller coaster. Well, nonprofits are doing this for many people. So give them the freedom to be able to uh, navigate the realities of life in meaningful ways for the students in the case of of um, educational settings um, that in their needs. In the pandemic, Chantel, I think absolutely. They needed funding for immediate basic needs. They needed mental health supports. They needed help navigating what has been very difficult for everybody. So I think, you know, sometimes it's called gender operating, but that you can't, you can't run a nonprofit if you can't turn on the lights, right? And if you can't pay your staff so you can hire competitive talent. So, so letting the nonprofits decide what the best use of the funding is to meet their mission, that's an indicator of trust. Yeah, I think that these are really important point. Um, as someone who came, I've, I've been in philanthropy for about seven years, but before that, for about 15 years, I was in a nonprofit world and ran a nonprofit. And so, you know, I always had a particular perspective of funders, uh, which I won't share because it wasn't necessarily the, the, the best opinion of funders, uh, but that power dynamic challenge is real. And it's something that we as funders need to be very, very uh, upfront and intentional about is how do we make sure that that doesn't completely skew things and how do we build that, that relationship? Because it is about, it can't be transactional, it has to be relational so that folks over time can see that, look, we're here to support you and know this work is really, really hard. That's like a, a starting point for me. It's like, when you do the uh, work on the ground, you got to bring humility and you got to understand it. It's sticky and complicated. And sometimes it goes the way you thought, sometimes not so much. And we're here to work with partners who are in it for the long term. And hopefully they see that over time that we are, we're engaged partners and that they can be more real with us. And then also on our side, understand that we are going to be taking, we, we, in some instances, we are taking more risk. And we, but we do that with eyes wide open and we do it with a purpose. Uh, and so you, you really have to be very deliberate and intentional about how you do that uh, to really imbue everything with equity uh, writ large as well as racial equity specifically if you're going to be working with more your grassroots smaller nonprofits uh, that are led by that are black led and people of color led. Yeah, and Richard, let me let me come back to you on on that point because again, just you know what you shared in terms of the uh, you know recent initiatives and really looking to fund more black owned businesses. Um, 
how, you know, how are you guys measuring that? Or what is, you know, what, what do you think is a good ROI uh, in terms of those investments? And is that the, um, you know, kind of more in the traditional lens or are you guys open to, again, thinking that, um, you know, just like funding nonprofits that are doing the work, uh, you know, uh, what might be, you know, a kind of a, you know, systemic or, you know, systematic way of thinking about, you know, success um, you know, what was that process like for you uh, there in terms of setting this initiative up and then, you know, really, um, you know, looking for those organizations or those businesses that you can fund and how do you think you'll measure uh, that success or, or do you think there's any challenges that might be, you know, inadvertently uh, there in that process to, to really allow those businesses to, to thrive and be successful? Yeah, you know, I'll tell you, there's always challenges challenges in measurement. Um, that's that from the onset is always a challenge. And it's a challenge because in some cases, it's, things are not as tangible as other things. It's where, you know, we're not, we're not producing widgets. You know, we're, we're supporting people, we're supporting organizations, we're supporting businesses. You know, I, I, I should say, I, maybe I should have mentioned this before, the, the, the program that we're doing with the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation is actually the very first time that American Express has actually supported uh, small businesses with grants uh, from its philanthropic effort. Well, we've been supporting small businesses for many years. We have a, you may have heard of the our Shopping Small Initiative and, and Small Business Saturday, which were created at American Express. But this is really our first opportunity to actually support um, black owned businesses and any small business at all. And so it's, it's, it's actually a, a gonna be a learning experience. And, and so one of the, some of the things that we are you know, thinking about is, you know, first of all, how many, how many organizations would we be able to support? Uh, how many organizations, how many black businesses could we support? And, and, and could we get those, the, when we went into this, we had uh, an idea that we wanted to get other, other corporate grant makers involved. And so we have organizations like Altice USA, this Cummings is involved in this, uh, AG, AIG Foundation is involved in this, uh, Stanley Black and Decker is involved in this, and there's some others as well. And so one of the success measures is we're able, would we be able to get a, get other other corporations to be involved? And so leveraging the funding that we we actually provided, providing the incentive, kind of going out there first, provided I, I think the motivation for other companies to join the uh, join the coalition and support. So there's 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 a a, a a win and a measurement right there. We we we've committed 10 million. I think we've We've actually raised an additional three to four million dollars for this initiative um, from other grant makers. So there, that's a that's a measurement that that I think we're very proud of. The others are, you know, more related to the organizations themselves. Uh, are they able to survive? Will they be able to increase their revenue? Will they be able to maintain and retain uh, people who work in those organizations? And so some of those are the, some of the things that we're tracking uh, with the restaurant program. It's a it's similar in that we're going to be supporting those organizations and, and we'll be asking them about uh, whether they will be able to, how many meals will they be able to serve because of this? What was the, what were the upgrades that were able to, uh, that the restaurants would be able to have because of this funding? Were they able to create a takeout business which would help them uh, survive part of this, the, the, the pandemic? And so there are some measurements, there's some very concrete things that we're gonna be looking at but you know, in very many ways, we're kind of in a new, a new territory because uh, we haven't really been here before. But it is—it's actually become uh, an interesting place to be, and it's um, one that we're going to be looking at very closely. And you know, it's—it's it's something which I think, in a, terms of a corporate philanthropic program, uh, the ability to be able to align with the business in a way so so succinctly is is important for us. And you talk about being relevant, uh, you know, even within a company. Even in that type of an environment, you know, the philanthropic effort, the CSR portions of the of the business needs to stay relevant. And so, by aligning with our our businesses and aligning with the projects that we're involved in, that also engage either other partners, uh, other business partners, or the company's own initiatives is critical to us as a as a a, a, a small unit within a very large company. Amazing. I'm so heartened to hear, you know, again, how, how everybody's really kind of thinking about, you know, this work um, and, and again, maybe thinking about it differently, right? And, and again, how that measurement and what that ROI means, you know, um, kind of needs to evolve in terms of, you know, 
uh, what that uh, you know, signifies for continued investments. We've got about five minutes left. And so there's so much more that I wanted to get into. And we knew that this conversation would go quickly. There's so much ground to try to cover in this short time frame. Um, I, I did, so let me kind of frame it this way uh, and, and let the, you know, each person kind of uh, pick what, uh, what approach they might want to take. But I'd love to hear either, you know, from you kind of as a parting uh, a comment to, uh, to our audience today, either any kind of, you know, challenges internally, we didn't really start to talk about internal uh, processes and structures that we might have to, you know, really reflect on. So if there's anything, you know, from a kind of your own internal work that you, you think is important to share, or just any other advice that you would want to, um, uh, you know, give those that are, that are with us here today, uh, you know, from your perspective, you know, as, as leaders, you know, in your organization. So, uh, again, let me just open up the floor and see if anybody wants to go first. If not, I'll, I'll gladly, uh, you know, pick someone to kick us off. I'm, I'm happy to go first. This is something that's a big focus because uh, I've only been here six months, but it pretty much started uh, soon after I started, which was doing a comprehensive organizational uh, racial equity assessment. And so if you're going to bring an equity lens and specifically a racial equity lens, you, you really have to first start by looking at yourself, kind of looking at yourself in the mirror. And one of the things we learned that was critically important because we actually had started a, an equity assessment back in 2019 and had to, to be honest, scrap it and start all over again because we didn't go, we didn't do it the right way and structure it the right way, which is the first step is really about putting a mirror to yourself and kind of figuring out and looking at where you're at right now and then where you've been and, and both from a quantitative perspective, but also a quality perspective. And, what kind of harm or not that's caused to different people within your organization or people you've worked with, whether nonprofits, vendors, or what have you. And really understand that and kind of have a, what I'll say, a constructive kind of racial reckoning, for lack of a better term, and, and reconciliation. So then you can move to being able to understand what kind of practices and behaviors and processes you need to put in place to change. And that really runs the gamut from your grant making to how, how you uh, invest your dollars, your, your corpus, and or uh, who, who manages those investments for you, who you have, you know, as your consultants, who uh, helps uh, provide you with coffee or, or, or staffs or, or community meetings or what have you, really the, your full business spend, in addition to how you, your own staffing works and who's part of your leadership team and, and really understanding that, the makeup of, your, of your, your own organization and how does it reflect the communities you're serving, both across the departments as well as from a hierarchy perspective. And so really taking a comprehensive look I think is really a good foundational step to really being able to think and act differently as it relates to issues of equity. I would agree with uh, Frank that if we're committed to building more equitable communities, then we need to engage in our own organizations to building more equitable organizations because a community is, is the sum of all of the individuals and organizations and institutions in it. And this is a journey and a long-term investment um, is required. I would also quote, I had the privilege of being in a session like this um, with our with Congressman, with um, Je John Lewis, um, may he rest in peace. And um, he, he put it so succinctly. He said, turn these protests, this was last year, into policies. So to the degree that we can focus on organi organizational policy, and public policy, uh, and that cuts across all sectors, right? We, through a race equity lens or through an equity lens, if, if, if you define it, um, but race actually is hyphenated with all other equity challenges and actually exacerbates uh, the gender and, and go on down the list. So then you, you're really getting to the sustainable solutions. And so protests into policy, I, you know, to quote, the venerable John Lewis. Yeah, I, I would, you know, add just listening to everybody talking today about the policy pieces and whatnot. It's it's a it's a great reminder. Uh, most of us here, all of us, have been doing this work for multiple decades, and and this is a you know, the the mission of the Global Livingston Institute is listen, think, act. And then you have to do it over again and over again. It's an iterative process. It's not a one-step process. This is a, a, the issues that we're talking around equity and the issues that have been raised. This is the beginning of a journey. This is not something we're going to fix. Uh, it's something that we're going to have to continue to improve on 
uh, over time. And even when we think we fixed it or gotten better at it, we can get better at it. Uh, and I think our challenge is to that this this conversation that you all have brought together today needs to be in our DNA. It should be everything that we do should have this lens attached to it so we can continue to improve as funders, as nonprofits uh, in the relationships that we have, that we should constantly be having this conversation in perpetuity. Uh, so I, I think it's such a great uh, reminder just listening to people talking about the work that they're doing. Chantel or Richard? Richard. I'll go ahead and go in and Richard can can take us home. Um, just echo, <laughs> just echoing uh, all the things. I mean, I was literally going to mention policy and, and put it into your DNA, you know, equity work, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I, you know, I feel like DEI is like a buzzword of like, did I do it? Check the box. It, it, it just doesn't <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It, it, it is it should be a part of the fabric of who you are as people, who we are as organizations, who we are as systems, districts, institutions of higher ed. Um, and so it, it is uh, something that is, a, it's a journey. It's, it, we're all on our own um, equity journey and it's something that we should think about and continue to work on um, even 10, 20 years from now. And so um, it, it, it blows my mind that it took, you know, a pandemic, uh, George Floyd and a political, um, um, a political climate to really have these discussions about race. And I'm like, you know, I've been black my whole life and, and, and this is this is nothing new, right? And so I think we need to really continue to think about um, these things and, and, and know that, there, that inequities really do exist. I remember thinking the first couple of weeks when the pandemic hit and the first thing school districts were doing was, you know, getting the food together and making sure students had food and people were, some were really confused about that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, some kids go to school and that's the only meal they have. A lot of kids go to school for safety, like that is a real thing. And for those of us that have been in, in the work for so long, like we knew those things, but now they're um, op open for the world to see, um, which I am hoping that an opportunity comes out of this where we can really push the needle. Because a lot of things that we've been knowing that have been um, gaps in our systems are now on the forefront for everyone to see. So again, I would just encourage folks to get into the work, get into social justice, really uh, be your full authentic self. Um, that is really hard in this um, in this current climate to just be who you are and, um, and, and step into that and own that and know that it is going to probably feel somewhat unpopular. Um, and then that is okay and continue to just continue to work and collaborate and we should all be having those conversations. And as you're thinking about hiring practices and board members and policies and funding really get get those perspectives in the room, really understand where everyone is coming from before we are making those decisions. Um, and, and, and that's it. Thank you so much for, for having me. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I just think that this is a, a very special moment. Um, and these moments don't come along that often. And, and I'm really hoping that we don't waste this moment. Um, we, we all have, um, have seen in the past how these types of moments have melted into the background, uh, and and while I, I really do see this 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 moment as a resilient as some resilience, uh, we really do need to back up all those wonderful statements uh, with real and tangible and bold actions, and, and I really do believe that that this is a moment that that this moment is really for everyone, that it's not singularly a black moment or a person of color moment, but really is an American moment. Uh, America will be better off if this DEI mo moment takes root because the weight of racial bigotry, the detrimental effects of anti-Black racism, the debilitating impact of systemic racism is a burden on America. And it has been for centuries. And I think by us really creating this moment and expanding on this moment, we can free our country from this, this bondage and really liberate all of us from it. So I really appreciate being part of this uh, and look forward to additional opportunities to, to, to network uh, with the group and with uh, other folks in the network. Well, I wanna thank everybody um, for your participation. What an incredible group of, of individuals, uh, you know, and again, super inspired. And I think some of the comments reflect again, just how inspiring these conversations are inspired by, you know, each of you in, in, in terms of your own work and your own perspective. And, uh, and Carol, I just have to, uh, again, come back to uh, recognizing all of the great work that you do 
Um, we wouldn't be, uh, I think, uh, on this call as a group together if it wasn't, you know, for you helping to make that happen. And so um, with that, again, just thank everybody uh, for your participation. And Carol, thank you for your leadership and making sure that we're all here together and, and having these tough but important and inspiring conversations with one another. Well, thank you, Oscar and everybody. And I want to say in a bigger way, Oscar is part of a group and Bernie Milano is on here as well, but Ann Elgard and Preful Shaw and um, Shannon Stone, there's kind of a, a group of people, Toya um, Wall from Ascendium, and they have been really looking at how do we really look at foundation and funding issues in a way that's really authentic and really real and um, that can galvanize some of the needed changes. So Oscar's been part of that for the last few months. And I think if, if you all are interested, we would love to have you all as part of that thought leadership team, because there are other people kind of in the space with other aspects of this. We went to the, um, Edgar did the Philanthropy So White session last week. I know um, Daryl will be on the session tomorrow. We have, a, we have a tech equity session at the same time, but, um, we just would like to invite you all, I can say on behalf of Oscar and Anne and this group that um, you guys have incredible talents and abilities and everybody has really different lenses and we need all those really different lenses to solve really, really wicked problems that we're all facing right now, which we're capable of solving. So thanks to everybody. It was awesome spending time with you guys and I look forward to the next time. And although I just say our so-called conference this year, you know, it's going to be virtual again, but it's not going to be virtual in 2022. So just like Denver on your calendar, June of 2022. And then we are going to have something very special in our event in June. It's going to be very student centered. And um, the theme is going to be um, reboot resilience, colon, um, uh, reboot resilience, uh, rebound remarkable. And every session is going to be how all of us from all of our different ways can rebound from the difficulties of the last year and go into next fall, you know, as strong as we can be. So, however, you know, you all wanna participate with us in that as well, but um, just been an honor to get to know each of you a lot better. And um, I wanna thank Celeste, cause she's behind the curtain there, but um, she makes a lot of things happen in the global minded world. So, um, and Marina and, you know, so, and I, I just wanna say we've got a million volunteers that help us. So it's a big network. It's not, it's not Carol. It's a big old network of people. So thanks for everything you guys. And we will have the recorded session in tomorrow's newsletter. We'll have it posted onto the YouTube channel and please share it widely with your circles. I think it was a really special, um, and, uh, uh, action driven conversation. Um, so I know it's going to lead to some great things happening. So thanks to everybody. And we'll see you next month for, um, the session it's international month of women next month. So we're still uh, cooking up. What are we doing for foundations and funders? So I'm going to be going to Anne for that one, but, um, looking forward to, uh, seeing you all in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you. Carol. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.